Ladies and gentlemen, I had the absolute honor and privilege of interviewing Thierry Lincou, former world number one, former world champion from France. He was one of my idols growing up. I still admire the man, and after speaking to him, I have even more respect for him than I ever did before. In this interview, we talk about Thierry's childhood, how he grew up on this tiny island of Réunion near Madagascar with only one squash court and how he became world number one and world champion from there, from those humble beginnings. We talked about Thierry's mindset, how he approaches the game, and for any of you who know Thierry's game and watched him in the past, you know that he was an epic, epic mover. So I had to ask him about one of his most famous ghosting routines, and he goes into detail about that as well. There are a ton of fantastic takeaways in this interview. I hope that you really enjoy it. As always, if you like it, please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, like the video if you do, leave a comment and share your thoughts or your feedback or something that really resonated with you. Share the video with a family or friend. I think that anyone, even outside of squash, can get a ton out of this man's knowledge and just who he is as a human being comes across greatly in this interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Take care and we'll see you soon. What's up, everyone? We have Thierry Lancou over here, former world number one, former world champion. He was in the top 10 for 10 consecutive years. He's the current coach, uh, current coach to MIT's men's and women's squash teams. He works very closely with U.S. squash, uh, and he advises Amanda Sobi uh, as well, one of the women's current world number four. So uh, if you haven't seen Thierry play, you know, I grew up, I didn't tell you this before we started uh, officially recording Thierry, but I grew up like idolizing your game. So for us to be having this conversation right now is uh, I feel very grateful and I, and I feel very appreciative of your time. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and MIT only has a men's team, but it's fine. It's okay, fine. only a men's team. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> We're trying to get more and more players to, to compete at MIT. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I love it. So, so Thierry, one of the first things I want to talk to you is about your youth. And from the little bit that I've heard and I've read about, you grew up um, in uh, Réunion and small not the most uh, modern training facilities. You didn't have a ton of people to train with. And for someone to come out of that environment and become world number one and to be at that level for so long, how did you do it? Like what, what was going on in your mind? What was driving you? Did you have a vision for yourself? Tell, tell me a little bit about that. I know yeah, that situation is pretty, uh, well, pretty unique and not very common. Uh, yeah coming from a tiny island next to Madagascar. So people can picture Madagascar, <laughs> but it's over there, you know, isolated. Uh, it's, it's really a family, it was a family thing. Um, my dad um, decided with a bunch of friends to build uh, a one squash court. And we're talking four walls, okay? <laughs> it's a big, um, just facility. Um, so it started like that, um, and then mother, like brother, was playing. So we started together purely for the fun of it. Um, I was eight. I lived really next to the court, so I, I used to spend hours and hours just purely by just, just because I loved it uh, with my neighbors and, and family and friends. And uh, you know, little by little, you know, first selection to go to the nationals you know when i was uh, 11 years old uh created some upsets and and got in third the first time and year after i won nationals and then the story began um at 14 i i started to have a more structural uh training and and sessions and honestly i think i, I got lucky to meet the right people and that's, mm -hmm. I think, venture is, is because of people you meet and the trust and your environment. So I think the decision was there. Um, parents were amazing because, you know, that we all know if you have that very nice cocoon and then you can thrive, you know. Right? And on the opposite, if, if there's things in the ways or 
conflicts and, and too much pressure, and it could be lethal, right? So, right. anyway, it was very sane, very um, simple, uh, right? On an island. So, um, I didn't have all that, maybe the craziness that, you know, people can feel or players sometimes. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, 14 years old, I had those two coaches, Frank and Paul. They lived in France, so I lived in Reunion. It's like 11 hours flight. Oh, wow. So from 14 to basically 17, I was, you know, trying to go and see them, visit them every other month or once every three months. And then they would send me, you know, my programs, training by fax. Wow. I used to write everything <laughs> responsible for my training. And that, I think that's... That's what gave me, you know, the values and, and the discipline and I, I think the desire, the will to always get a little better. So I was in charge. I was in charge, mm. you know, doing all the feedbacks and, and completing all the numbers, you know, the sets, ghosting, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was in charge of, you know, reading of the whole plan, understanding and try to, of course, <laughs> apply things, right? So I think um, it gave me that responsibility at an early age. And, and um, yeah, um, just that, that motivation and determination mm -hmm. that I didn't have the whole, you know, set of opportunities that other people had back in the days. And I, I could see all the top players, juniors from France, um, you know, having a different treatment, of course, big clubs, you know, big players, big clubs, and training partners. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> let's try to, you know, make the best out of that and with what I had. And, yeah, the drive came from the love of the game, but also always me from 14, 15 to always prove that, I could, you know, I, I could also do a good job in isolation and I could compete with the top, the national rank players. Um, so that, 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 was, that, that was the story and that's led me to winning all the nationals, uh, seven in totals, uh, you know, juniors, and then being world, uh, European number one and, and I finished third at the World uh, Junior Championship in New Zealand. Behind, uh, you might know them. <laughs> so, Ahmed Barada and Omar al -Borosi. Got it. Got it. That's the picture. Got it. So, uh, that's, that's amazing. So, you know, a couple of the key things that stood out to me were it started from passion and love and enjoyment. And I think you mentioned autonomy and ownership as a huge thing, which you know, which is high, closely linked to intrinsic motivation because you, you had control over what was going on. And this is fantastic because I see, you know, some of the kids that I coach now and that I, and other kids that I speak with, a lot of them through this pandemic, for example, have not had the motivation to go and train because in their minds, like there's no tournament coming up. What do I have to train for? And, you know, I never reached the same level as you, obviously. I'm, I'm originally from Pakistan. I didn't start playing till I was 14 or 15, uh, taught myself how to play and eventually reached a, a, a decent level. But obviously it, it, I started so late, didn't have proper coaching and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but for me, squash was like, I loved being on the court. I used to enjoy going and doing solo for two hours if that's what it took after watching like I, I taught myself how to play by watching videos of Jahangir and Jan Shea, uh in front of my computer in slow motion so I would go frame by frame and I would like mimic their movements and <laughs> I try to see like how are they doing this <laughs> and that's why you're so good in uh, doing your analysis and video analysis. I like that. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, you know, it, it, that's how I started thinking about the game. And I got into it initially because of my father and the passion that came from kind of playing with him and playing with a fun group of people at the community center near my parents' home when I was a teenager. 
so for me, it's like, even now I'm, uh, I'm 36. I'm not like competing anymore. I coach, uh, I have a three-year-old daughter at home and, but I love going on court. I still do solos. I'll still push myself with my fitness. I still do all that stuff. And then when all these kids come, they're like, I don't have the motivation to do it. I, there's no tournament in my head. I'm like, well, I feel like you've missed the boat a little bit <laughs> because there's something more. So, you know, when you were talking about all these things, uh, I thought that was really, really reassuring and positive to hear that. You know, what, what are your thoughts on some of these ideas? And then, and then tell you the truth, in Reunion Island, I could have, I was doing multiple activities. Um, I was doing rugby a little bit, you know, swimming. Like I was biking with my dad, uh, like road biking. I was doing uh, like surfing or boogie boarding. Mm-hmm. I could have spent time like outside and you know do different things but and ju- i was doing judo as well yeah, i had to pick between the two. that was pretty good in judo and that's probably uh that gave me a lot of also uh great great uh, skills you know judo and, and foundation for in terms of balance and stability and, and self-control you know the whole values of, of martial arts uh, concentration, you know, calm. So that that was superb, such a platform for me to just, I think, uh, do well in squash. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I, th- I think that the I picked up squash because I, I just loved it. I, I was obsessed with it and uh, trying to figure out things by myself. Like like you said, you know, trying shots, uh, drops from the back, uh, cross court or, or stuff like that, or getting the need, trying to understand why. And I think it's kids, maybe kids, <laughs> going through the lesson as if it was just another tutoring lesson or a math lesson, so like extra activity. I don't feel, in, sometimes I don't feel enough passion or effort and involvement in terms of, oh, I, oh, I need to really understand what's going on here. I, 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 I want to do it better than that. And, and too often they rely on too much feedback. So, but anyway, that's a different, it's for some, but I think the one who really, the one who really get to the top or further are the ones that are, that are really extra desire, you know, to, to, to do things well. And that's it. That's, it. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's uh, the, the, the thing that I'm always, it, it makes me happy when I see a kid that's curious or a kid that's asking questions because it goes back to your point about understanding why. And I try to drip that into them by, you know, by asking them questions and saying, well, you know, why do you think this happened? Or why do you think that happened? Or what caused this? Or what would you do in this situation? And most of the time you get a blank stare. <laughs> and it's like, oh man, we need, we need to, we need to get this in the head a little bit. <laughs> Do it. Hey, so, and being, being in the US, I, I, I see kids that have a lot of, just a, a, a lot of, um, what can I say? Le- like different lessons. The, the schedule is just insane. After school, there's so much after school. I was growing up, oh, different country, different culture, of course, like you. And it's, but I feel like we had a bit more free time, I, I, I don't know, to explore different things and i don't know what's good or bad different systems for sure but yeah it's becoming very competitive here academically i think in the us uh, and we, as we know goals are universities colleges and so and there's so you know there is so much support to excel academically to have a chance so that's why it's it's yeah yeah, and there's something to be said. There's there's definitely value in the high level of professionalism, which has come into everything, you know, having that set routine, that set structure and all of that. But the, the thing that I'm always, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, the thing that I always reflect upon is at what age does that become effective? Because, you know, sometimes I see these kids that are 12 and 13 even which is in my opinion still quite young and you know they're they're going through the grinder and sometimes even like eight nine are going through the grinder on and on and on and um you know the i think the pieces that you mentioned earlier about autonomy and ownership and desire and the will i think once those pieces are in and it's coming from within and it's not being an external push uh to do it 
then then it doesn't feel like work, right? Then it feels like, hey, I'm here to do it because I want to do it. I'm choosing to do it. But when you're getting that external push with all this pressure, well, now it's like, okay, well, what's going to happen? And and some people might say, hey, that's a good thing because it's simulating real life and there's pressure in life and you have to learn how to deal with it. And I'm sure there's an argument for that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, each individual is unique. And each person deals with things at different phases and different stages and in different ways. And I think that's one of the most challenging pieces is trying to figure out that, hey, what worked for Thierry will not work for Ahad and will not work for Matt. And there's always has to be a little bit of customization. As, a, as an instructor, as a coach, as a mentor, we need to, be, uh, to have that social intelligence as well, emotional intelligence to, to adapt yourself and adjust. And I think... And that's, that's why today I feel blessed and fulfilled because I get to work with the whole spectrum, it's like kids, um, you know, like mini squash or, or like, like little kids, you know, eight, nine, and even, and then juniors, you know, top juniors, and then college people, um, of course, MIT players, and then Team USA, the pros, you know, Amanda, Victor Coin, uh, and all of those guys. But anyway, that's that's great. And even some lessons to some 80, 80 years old, 75 years old people. But that's but it's cool. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And there, there's something about the older people. I, I actually love working with the older adults because they're the <laughs> ones that come in with the most energy and enthusiasm and they're so keen to just learn. <laughs> you need to rethink also, you know, the way you're constructing the rally because you know sometimes it's like the reverse boss is working for them or or like the the the, the volley return short all the time or stuff like that you know so. <laughs> yeah exactly there's one gentleman who i coach he's uh, 72 and he sent me an email first and this is all virtual and he sent me an email and he's like hey i'm 72 can you help me and I said, absolutely. And, you know, through the video, because everything I do is through video with people remotely. It's like, well, hey, you know, if you make this minor tweak with your body, well, suddenly you're going to have this option. Or it's like tactically, you know, put the ball here and then look at their options. And their option is probably going to be a straight fluff up or a boast. So come up and play a drop. <laughs> and like, you know, you're creating like one, two shot rallies and it works. That's the best thing. <laughs> yeah. So. I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned this piece about values and beliefs earlier, and it coming from judo in many cases. And there were many things that I really admired about your game. Uh, one of them was your mental toughness, your poise, uh, your ability to what looked like maintain evenness. Um, it was rare that you, I don't think I ever saw you have an outburst. You, you obviously know more better than me. I remember hearing a couple of, uh, I seeing a couple of stern looks towards a couple of players here and there. Uh, but, you know, never like nowadays, some of the players lose it. And, you know, the racket goes flying and there's yelling and all sorts of stuff. I'd love to hear, you know, were there certain things that you did specifically from judo that you continued doing through your career that really helped you maintain that poise? Was it, um, setting deliberate intentions about the way you wanted to appear on court and then following through with that. I'd love to hear kind of your thought process and, and approach to it. Yeah. So I think, first of all, I think this is my personality to be um, pretty chill, cool, calm um, in general, but I have that cold blood aggression. I think that that was something coach, my coaches were a very, um, Obsessed about and focused about it. it's like okay you want to be aggressive but in a good way okay like like not in a hated way and with lots of energy and stuff but but very uh, well offensive attacking aggressive having that mindset of going forward but but very uh, yeah very, very channel yeah um, judo taught me a lot like I said because judo you you you're physically engage right you, you you i mean you're grabbing you know the you know the the g and and then you, you have to yeah you have to to score and and you need to to be efficient as well in your effort it's not just 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 not moving and, and shaking the other guys it, it's it's actually 
finding the right moment to engage your throw and, and, and everything. So I think judo taught me a lot about, you know, being super uh, intense, intense, explosive, aggressive, but in the same time, keeping my patience, right? And finding the right moment to strike, right? Um, I, was, I was pretty good in judo. And I, at a certain point, I, I could have continued, you know, this way. Um, anyway, the squash was more fun. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can so, I ask you one question about, yeah. about that? So you're talking about that aggressiveness and channeling and harnessing that aggressiveness. One, one thing that I personally struggled with early on was I'm not naturally a confrontational aggressive person and I used to have the challenge in squash to say hey if I'm being aggressive I'm now in a in a fight against this person and that never meshed with my personality until I made the switch to say I'm being aggressive and trying to achieve the best that I'm capable of by testing my skills to see how much earlier I can take the ball, how much more dominant I can be and so on and so forth. So I had to reframe the problem from, in my own mind from it's not me versus him, it's me versus myself and doing better to dominate this T. Did you have that sort of thought process in your life? Yes, exactly. So, so then the mindset was, okay, uh, no matter who you play, it's, you, you need to be in a zone, right? And that's, that's the thing. My aggression was not towards or, you know, I have nothing against my opponent. You know, he's here. He's a good guy, hopefully. And I, I'm here to just try to beat his game plan, not try to beat the person. So my, my, my focus was always, my energy was into the game plan, into the, the, the ball. It's like, I'm going to hit that ball so well that he's going to be in trouble, that he's going to have to lunge and die in the corner. You know, so I had nothing against my, my, my opponents, my players. And I think that's why I would not show anything, even if I was sometimes upset or a tough moment. Oh, I would not be angry because I don't think it's, it was sustainable in terms of um, delivering the highest quality of squash. If you get mad, I think it can give you that rush of adrenaline and anger for a couple of points, half a game, but then, but then what? Then, then you're going to drop and it's going to be awful. So in my mind, it was, okay, try to conserve the mental, the, the nervous energy because you have, you know, like a reservoir. It's if you just ruin it with temper and that's, that's <laughs> you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You know, it's just... So for me, it was, okay, let's be as efficient as possible. No emotions, you know, just, just stay calm, uh, very vigilant, very attentive, but stay calm and, and try to be locked in, to the, in the game plan, the, the, the winning tactics. And that would release some anxiety and, and stress and pressure because I would not think about, the outcome, my opponent, the draws, the results, but just, you know, channeling everything into the game plan. So, and that's what I try to teach my kids too and my team. And it's like a high pressure situation, try to regroup and just think about the next rally and, and what you have to accomplish and not just, oh, I'm going to win. I have to win no matter what, but that's not going to help you win. It's just wanting to win at all costs, it's not going to help you win. And it's going to lead you to lose. But so that was kind of uh, the mindset. And, and that's how I didn't really show um, external, you know, anger, or nervousness and stuff. Um, so that was my, that was my thing. Surely with judo, with my environment, with the way I was raised um, and be respectful as well to referees. To, my, to the players, to the public. To, and I was very considerate of, of, of the outside as well, how I present myself, how I conduct myself in court, my image, what, what image are you going to give to the people, to the public, to the squash in general. And honestly, I was pretty, yeah, I, I, I was aware of that. I, was, I, was, I, I wanted to deliver the, the best image as possible. 
That's pretty neat. Like uh, you had a lot of uh, a lot of factors that you were kind of cognizant of. But I, I think a couple of the things that you mentioned were um, I love it because it's the same stuff that I'm always harping on uh, with people about is process oriented thinking versus outcome oriented thinking. And the thing that I always go back to is that, you know, there are controllable and uncontrollable factors. The outcome is uncontrollable. The process you have some, ch you can control your effort. And, you know, maybe I'm sure you've heard this. There's this, uh, I, I tell everyone, and I'm, I'm going to say it again, even though I've said it a hundred times, there's this coach, this former UCLA basketball coach, John Wooden, and he defined success. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing as the peace of mind that is attained by knowing that you, you did the best that you're capable of. And his entire thing of success was effort-based. And that goes back to process orientation. And you can't focus on the, if, whether the referee made a bad call because you can't change that. You can't focus on whether the ball took a lucky bounce because you can't change that. What you can change and focus on, and those are other words that I want to talk about a bit more about focus and attention, is what you can do next, what fits with your game plan, and then being aware. You've used awareness a lot, and I love that. You're being aware of what is my opponent doing that might be harming me in this game, or what am I doing that's allowing my opponent to take advantage and put me under pressure? So, you know, being aware of all these things and then controlling your game plan, I think, is critical. What I used to say is that the things that you can control, that you can even control is preparation. And that, that's, that's a big thing. Preparation, effort, and attitude. Th those three, you're responsible and you should be able to, you know, to manage those versus outcome. So that's, honestly, if you do that, then no matter what happens, it's just... You talked about focus and attention. And nowadays, there are all these things from, you know, meditation practice and mindfulness practice and all sorts of things like that. Which, uh, which I think are extremely valuable for training just the skill of attention and focus. Did you ever, I don't know how big it was, you know, when you were growing up, but did you ever leverage practices like that? Or did you train your focus and attention through in goals on court, through drills and condition games? How, how did you train some of those skills? So at 18, at 18 years old, I, um, I started to lose against I said to lose against um, someone of my age, uh, Jean-Michel, uh, a French guy that I, I always used to beat when I was younger at nationals, always beating him. And then at 18, like 17, 18, you know, when we went into the, the big, you know, PSA and like, men's game, 18, 19, and he, he started to beat me like match after match. And I was like, hold on a second. That's, and, and I could not, it, it, yeah, I just, I just couldn't, you know, find a way. So I had to, um, I had to go and my dad, you know, advised me to go and see someone um, just to work on, on, on you know, mental, uh, just a little bit of a relaxation, awareness. It was called, I don't know the word in English, but it was called sophro sophrology, 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 I don't know. But it's, it's breathing with being super aware of your body, okay? And we did, did some visualization as well. So I was introduced pretty early, you know, 18, to the concept of mental training. So, and that, that year, I won the men's nationals at, at, at 19 years old. So... So for me, um, I, I, I think I, I realized that was, a, uh, of course, one element of performance for sure. You know, it was just not soloing or fitness or drilling, but that was one component of that. Then, of course, with my coaches, we were we were always try to they were always trying to put up sessions where we would work the system so as much as possible so in, within a one session try to work okay the physical part technical part and you know technical and then mental part as well so i honestly i didn't spend a lot of time at the gym like lifting and stuff maybe a little bit but most of it was always very specific um, to just be just just wanting to be more efficient, I guess, 
and working all together. And the mental side was the same as well. It's everything was very intentional, um, where you, you you had to be aware and understand at different levels, you know, the drills and why and the patterns and um, to be better in anticipating. And I think for us, the big thing was anticipation. It was, it was like, okay, you need to think quicker than and process quicker. So it's, it's you know, with those drills, try, try to think ahead, always think ahead, always, because, my coaches, they, they, they've seen, you know, the, the era before and some of those drills and that was very pretty, not basic, but like, you know, okay, that, they, they were very, um, what can I say, predictable, simple, bus drive, bus drive, and then this and that. And then they were like, you know what, we need to inject more options, just, just, just more Open, open shots, just more open shots for you to, to be able to treat as much information as possible. So we didn't spend a lot of time, of course, spend time to work on steadiness, being super like, consistent. Yes, of course, that's the phase. But then very quickly, a lot of options, you know, a lot of options in order to, like, to think like, like uh, well, and anticipate. So, and that's, I think that's what gave me a little edge at some point. And um, to um, everything combined, I think it, it worked pretty well in, in terms of understanding the intention of my opponent, being aware after every rally, okay, what's good, what's bad, what adjustment should I do? And, and of course, I had, on the later stage, I had to work with a different a sports psychologist to help me reach the very last steps but that's that's it overall interesting so well i'm gonna i'm gonna take a guess here take a stab at what a sample based on what you just said a sample session could look something like a set time limit because that maybe it's a set time limit or time limit per exercise because then you're working physically that's addressing a physical component uh, or maybe it's just full effort for however long the session is. Um, maybe, uh, did you do a lot of pressure, like pressure session type of things where your coaches had I, options and you were chasing balls to read them? No, no, I, I didn't have the luxury to have someone just feeding me. Okay. Um, but I would, I would, with someone else, you know, someone else having more options than I had. Got it. So just restricted condition games, basically. <laughs> exactly. So... Yeah, no a coach like feeding me everywhere, but more a, a decent player, club player, or, or another top athlete. And we would do condition games a lot, a lot, a lot. And then, of course, a lot of ghosting, a ton of ghosting with mental representation. And that's, I think that's also what maybe set me apart at the beginning, you know, my movement and, and efficiency on court and, and I think the combination between being endurant but quick as well um, and, and not wasting, you know, um, maybe energy in, in, in wrong steps or anything like that. So I think that, that was one thing um, that we really emphasis, you know. Interesting. Yeah, one of the things I always admired about your game was your movement and how efficient it was. And clearly that stemmed from a lot of the ghosting that you did. I, you, you alluded a little bit to judo also giving you a lot of that stability and that strength and proprioception and balance and stuff like that. Flexibility as well, yeah. Judo went up and, and even stretching, working on, you know, lunging, flexibility, that, that was, yeah, that was big. Interesting. And you mentioned this piece about, you know, the balance between having a strong aerobic base, but then also having the quickness and the explosiveness. Was that something that you sort of naturally had since you were a youth? Were there specific drills? I, I've seen some of your videos on YouTube where you do, you know, like the explosive one step in, one step back, ghosting to train that. Um, you know, th this is a question that I'm asking because I get asked this question a fair Everything bit by others. Everything <laughs> was planned. Yes. It's funny because I... And everything was 
very scientifically planned by my coaches. So it, it's because I, I watched that movie King Richard yesterday, last night, and I was like, oh my gosh. So what he did with the, the sisters, you know, with Serena and, and Vince, it's like, he had the plan, he knew it. And, uh, and he was talking about the open stance all the time in that movie. And I was like, whoa, that's incredible. Because I remember back in the days, we were not the first ones, but we were kind of, you know, the one using a lot of open stance on that back end, on that back end, a lot. And um, that was a way to play quicker and to get back quicker to the T as well. And, and it was funny on the, in the movie, that was exactly what the dad was telling, you know, coaches at the time, you know, he was, he was, he was talking to the coach of um, uh, McEnroe and Sampras and he was saying, oh, uh, you should do open stance because they're going to get quicker back in the middle and stuff. And then, you know, so like I said, we had to disrupt as well certain techniques and certain patterns you know, to create like, not new ways, but different ways, different ways. But scientifically, yes, all my sessions from the age of 14 till the rest were well, you know, thought out. Um, yeah, speed work, you know, outside, inside, plyometrics, jumps, uh, um, uh, Endurance, so long endurance, very high endurance, uh, 200 meters, 2,000 meters, ghosting and endurance, ghosting in interval. It, I, I mean, there's a ton. That's, <laughs> and that's why, fitness-wise, I think I've been, I've been there. I've done some sessions. And, and I, know, <laughs> I know it's not easy to have that right combination between being super quick, nimble, explosive, and for a long time. This is a very, that's why squash is very difficult. That's why it's very difficult, yeah. But it's possible, it is possible. You're the example. <laughs> it's, no, yeah, I, it's funny because uh, actually uh, Victor's roommate, I believe, George, he, I used to coach George uh, when he lived over here and uh, he and I just had this conversation the other day. He was asking me for some advice on, you know, how should I train getting the right balance between speed and endurance and strong enough legs and explosiveness, et cetera. And, you know, there's this science is showing so many different things. Experience like yours, for example, is showing things slightly differently where science now is saying, you know, you want to be strong, you want to be fast a lot of people are saying you have to lift heavy weights as well. And, and there's some, there's some benefit and value to that for sure. I think everyone's body types are different. I think uh, some people gain confidence from that as well. Yeah. I just, just yesterday I saw a video of Joel Macon doing like, you know, something ridiculous, like 300 pounds in a lunge, like in a split squat and doing five reps of that. So, but you know, I know, for example, you never did anything like that from the sounds of it. Uh, for you, it was a lot of track work, plyometrics, uh, endurance, ghosting, speed, ghosting, etc. And, and that's, that was the conversation I was having with George was, you know, you have to look at what your body is like, you have to look at what your base strength level is like, what your mobility and flexibility is like, what maybe a big part of it is what, where, where are you excited to go? Like, do you want to be in the gym and do some strength work? If you do, that's probably going to benefit you because it's going to give you confidence. If you don't want to be in the gym and do strength work, well, you can do a ton of stuff with bands and track work and ghosting and all of that too. Uh, so I was curious to hear your thoughts about it because finding that balance between endurance and agility and explosiveness is, as you pointed out, very challenging. The, the, the one thing that I was uh, working a lot with a weighted, weighted vest. So doing everything in the function of squash. You know, I, I would not, 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 I'm not saying a waste of time because my time was precious as well, as we know. Um, I, I wanted to do things as specific as possible. So that's why. Weighted vest, you name it, 10 pounds, I don't know, three, four, five kilos. Um, and in, in some sessions, so that's, that would help in, you know, having a bit more resistance and stuff or, or speed work with the, you know, with the resistance band as well. So, like ghosting on speed on court with certain resistance. So um, I was a big fan of 
a lot of specific stuff and I, it would drive me crazy back in the days when I would see other people like ghosts. It was like they were running on course in different ways and I was like, whoa, that's... Even to these days, course sprints, it's, it's, it's a good workout, yes, but you might as well do the proper movement. Why not do the proper movement? Because a lot of people are doing that. Okay, okay, fine. It's good to push mentally. It's a nice workout. But why not do the, 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 you know, the good moves? Well, that's what you were saying, right? Well, if you do the ghosting, if you, if you use some of the criteria, the rubric that you laid out earlier, we, you want to try to get the technique, the fitness, the tactics, you want to get the physical, you want to get all of that mental in yeah. one as efficiently as possible. So the court sprints will get you the physical, they'll get you some mental for sure, but you're missing the tactics and the technique. Yeah. If you do the ghosting, now you have all of them. And then, uh, and then plus it's been scientifically proven that when you do a gesture or like a movement being cognizant and, 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 and aware, it creates the same, the same network or in your brain as if you're hitting that ball so that was it's a double effect it's just more beneficial so the more you're going to repeat the good stuff the more it's going to translate into you again so that, that's i think that's yeah i love that so what, what was the and i'm not encouraging that anyone goes out and does this but what was like the the intense theory ghosting session something for endurance versus something for like speed work. What did the reps and sets and stuff look like? You no, know, like a typical, a typical um, would be, you know, may, maybe do forty-five seconds on, okay, thirty off, okay, and that. You and how, do... how fast are you going? Like how many corners? How many shots are you hitting? So this one would be maybe. I would I would probably do so six points, right? So two in the front, two in the side, two in the back. And I would probably do 15 to 16 corners uh, or points, okay, for 45 seconds. So maybe, I, th I think maybe 80, 85% of maybe a maximum output. And then that's the first set. I would do that 12 times, 10 to 12 times. Set number one, a little rest. Set number two, I would do 30, 30 seconds on and 25 off. And this one would be, 12, it's a good number. If you can do 12 in 30 seconds, that's, that's a good one. 11 to 12. And are you doing this randomly and playing out the rally in your mind at the same time? You can do that or you can do a pattern, one after the other, yep. okay? The other direction. You can, yeah, you can mess up or you can even do a, a V, like a V if, if you want to, okay? Front or back or side or diagonal. So that... But every time, you know, depends. You can do eight times, 10 times, 12 times, 15 times, depending on, on your level. And then, you know, and then set number three, maybe, maybe do 30, 20, you know, less recovery. And that's, and I think that's the goal is to put you at the maximum output. So 30 seconds is basically like a, a match ball. It's, it's like a, it's like a big rally. Okay. 30 seconds. So it's, it's to get you out there in that, uncomfortable zone but then having you know because you want to recover as much as possible as well so you're training your, your heart to like go high and low super fast recovery you know fast recovery to then being 100 percent for every rally so that's it's designed to repeat 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 so then you won't you just you can back back it up back it up so third set will be 30 20 and then you, you can you can you can tweak the times, but I would do five sets because five games mentally okay I can I can last five games, you know because if you only do three or four, then there's something missing. But anyway, so that would be my hundred percent session, you know five sets and every every set twelve fifteen reps. It's so it, it anyway. So that's it. One that that was kind of a, my signature, like like a big one, yeah, like a big one. Okay. Well, anyone who's listening, don't go and try fifteen sets, <laughs> fifteen reps per set. That's <laughs> you. You're not going to survive that. So please don't go injure yourself. <laughs>
what I love with working with my teachers is that they always came up with like nuances, like a little, like different. We were working basically the same components, you know, the same thing, you know, goals, but bring it in a little differently. So I was never getting bored. Uh, there was always a lot of excitement, you know, the next program. Okay, next summer, and this, and that. And how, how did you manage your recovery? Because, I mean, that kind of stuff is obviously, it's pretty taxing. And then I'm assuming you were still getting on court outside of that, whether it was solo or drills or condition games or whatever. How did you manage recovering and staying healthy through all of this? Yeah. So the one thing I'm very proud of is that I did not get it. I, not never, but I, I pretty much never got injured. So... Because, yeah, to, to be able to sit 10 years in top 10 or even top five, and then because um, I see people getting injured very often, more often, maybe nowadays, I don't know, um, even back in the days anyway. But I think th that's why the scientific approach really helped me to recharge and not getting burnt out. And, that's, and maybe it was, you know, um, other people would maybe work, I don't know if it's harder, the work, but differently, but with, with more volume or, or differently, but then at what cost? So there's always a fine line. There's a, I think everyone is different, as you said, but my recovery was super important. In a week of seven days, I would take two days off. Or at, two days off, or at least or one and a half. Yeah, that's interesting because I mean, now and now nowadays people are trying to just fit more and more and more in and they're taking less and less rest, which obviously yeah. leads to more injury. <laughs> and so that's why it's. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. So. Uh, yeah, I think that that was super important and, and try to um, try to have a balanced life as well, of course, you know, as, as an athlete, you want to have different interests, you know. And uh, a thing, what a good thing that I love in the movie yesterday as well, is that when when Venus was done with the tournament with the match, the dad was saying, "Oh, just now they were all in the bus in a little uh, car van, and anyway, guys, just talk about something else but tennis, please, just just." So it was a good way for them to remain kids you know or teenagers and, and just live in like, a, like a normal life as well but as an athlete one of my um, mental dreams was okay in a tournament once you play your match once you hopefully you win you win you have the little window where you're stretching cooling down stretching okay okay thinking about what went right or wrong and what you could have done better and, but then after that just for, just 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 move on just move on don't try to like repeat and, and talk with people about your match again and again and again so that's draining yes 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 no, that's so, that. yeah and in order to be fresh as fresh as possible to the final and to the final point of the final day I think those are strategies that can help you. But that's not easy with social media as well nowadays. It's just constantly. So it's, it's tough to unplug, right? As an athlete as well, it's just you always engage and I don't know. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I mean, it's in your face all the time, right? And, I, and that's where some of the maybe the discipline and the habits and that kind of stuff comes out. It's like, well, once your match is done, you know, put your phone away or just turn your notifications off. So it's not just popping up in your face all the time, right? There are definitely things, again, going back to the controllable factors we talked about earlier. Uh, this is part of your preparation and it's your process. If we can control certain facets of it, then uh, more power to the athlete. But uh, I know we're, we're running out of time here. So I want to ask you maybe one more question. And I'm <laughs> yeah, this, this goes, uh, so you know, you talked a little bit about getting into the zone and this idea of flow state. And I talked to Laura Massaro uh, not too long ago, and she had told me that 
well, you know, obviously flow state, the way research defines it is, you know, you get into this thing where time slows down and you, you know, if it's the ball, you're seeing the ball bigger, you're reading the game better and all of that. When I spoke to Laura, she was talking about never really finding flow that way for her flow and her superpower, she said, was like consistently executing her game plan and not really getting distracted, but she never experienced the slowdown of time and things like that. Had, what's what's your experience been like with flow state? What, what is your definition, I guess, of flow state? And had you ever found a way to get into your zone consistently? So I think, um, like I said earlier, in preparation for matches, big matches, tournament, I, I would do I would do my homework, right? And we didn't have videos and all those clips and replays. We didn't have that. Too. So we had notes. Okay, that's what we had. So try to feed myself with, you know, with notes from months ago or playing that person again and try to write stuff like on, on you know, I was at the hotel and in every room they have the little notepad. They have the little. So I would, okay, this one. And I would try to think ahead about you know, the game plan, of course, and how I would approach that player, okay? And that would really help me to visualize, to represent myself, the match, to leave the situation before it really happened, uh, to reduce stress, to reduce anxiety, to know what to do. Um, and that would help me to sometimes, well, be in the flow, but definitely be in the zone, definitely be not thinking about anything else, but okay. I'm going to apply that strategy. I'm going to go out there, hit the tightest possible rails, all the more. And then, you know, for, depending on the players, it was like, okay, I, I need to, you know, work him a bit more to the back or moving more to the front. Be, be careful about his, you know, his skills, be careful about this and that, of course. But I had, you know, my worlds, uh, everything was clear. And that, I think that really was a way for me to stay in my bubble. In between the rallies, I would talk to myself, like internally as well, very much. So while I was picking up the ball or before serving, big breathing, daily breathing, very much deep, relax, you know, try to regroup, be composed, talk to myself, okay, tight, determination, you know, stuff like that, stuff that would keep me on track. Or pit bull was another one. Or aggressive, pit bull, volley, positive. You know, you have your words. And then I would fight other external thoughts because you're fighting against yourself. Like you said, you know, it's, it's like you're the one in charge. So thoughts that are coming in and say, oh, you got this. That's going to be easy now. You know, it's done. It's tired. You know, it's going to be easier. No, it's never, it's never going to get easier. So it's finding, you know, because of course you want to, you want to stop the effort. It's so painful. Sometimes you're pushing through and pushing through rally after rally. Your body is in extremely like pain. Your, 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 your brain is going to, going to explode because the intensity of concentration is insane. Especially when you, well, at, at, at the high level, everything goes so fast, so accurate. So, you know, people with a lot of deception, it's like your, your brain is burning out. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I remember like playing power back in the days, or you, you didn't know where the ball was going. I say, oh my gosh, or Shabana or Rami, or, oh my gosh. Anyway. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, I needed, you know, strategies to, to, to cope with that and, and to stay maybe in a flow sometimes. Yes, I would feel amazing, you know, oh, today, oh, my lens were impeccable. That will allow me to do so much more with the ball and voting and very because of that. And I was, for me, that was kind of the flow. Yeah. And did you, I know you mentioned earlier that as you reach the highest, highest levels of the game, you ended up working with a psychologist or a sports psychologist later. Was this part of the work you did with, uh, with that psychologist? Yeah, at 25, I got stuck uh, in, a, in a, I got stuck in a top five in the world for, for one, two years. And I couldn't, I mean, I was blocked, you know, and 
we're talking Peter Nicole number one, or Power one, two, you know, for years and years. <laughs> John White, whether they are Martin Heath, anyway, Palmer. So I, I had, I think, too much respect to those guys. And I had to see someone. Yeah. And um, yeah. And the game was got tougher, you know. Physically speaking, ah, you know, you would play Palmer or, or, or Power sometimes. It's a different mindset as well. And I needed to get some help to not always, you know, it's to, to cope with some physicality sometimes, you know, and that, that, that happens in a match. So, um, yeah. And again, a lot, of, a lot of breathing techniques, a lot of visualization, like I said, a lot of melt drill to give me the confidence, you know, as if you're hitting some solo, I had my mental drills every day, um, just thinking I was the better player, just you know, seeing myself beating everyone. So that's yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm such a such a huge advocate of the visualization and just training our mind. It's you know, this this idea. I'd never thought of it until I heard it the first time, and then I was like, wow, this makes total sense. Is everything in front of us right now, at some point, didn't exist and was only in someone's imagination in their mind and when we put the thing in here if we can see it then we eventually find a way to manifest it into reality and all of the other values and beliefs that you talked about with the you know the effort the perseverance the determination and you know calm and relaxation and all of those things well then all of those things come together and if you have the visualization the belief then the action eventually takes care of itself uh, or the outcome eventually takes care of itself through consistent action. So it's, um, it's fantastic. I mean, you mentioned Rami in the game getting tougher and tougher. How did, I remember what, just the other day, I was watching a couple of highlights of you playing Rami, I think it was 2009 or something like that, when he was still, a, you know, first on the scene as, a, as a, on the PSA. I mean, he's, he obviously played the ball faster and volleyed more and had more deception and stuff like that. Was it a bit of a shell shock the first time he came on? Oh, because I've, I've mentioned players, but I'm really, I've got a real respect for everyone of, of my generation, the one before, the one after, the, all those guys, the top 10, I mean, the, the, the top, it's, it's, it's an achievement and we, we understand that now, I mean, right? So I talk about Nicole Power White, Shabana Bichil, you know, Boswell, Darwish, Ricketts, and then the Nick, you know, the James, uh, Will Strop, and then Greg, and then... Uh, Rami, so but at the end it was Rami Shobagi, really, that were like showing up, you know, and that that they showed me the way out as well. <laughs> those, oh my gosh, uh, but have, all of those players were exceptional, exceptional in their own style, in their own way, and I'm proud to be able to say that I was able to beat at least at least all of them at least once. Okay, I. I had kind of a complete game as well and, and could come up with, you know, a certain way. To, but Rami, in, 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 I saw him the first time in Egypt when I was training before. I, I don't know, I was there for maybe like a, a world championship or something. And he, he was on the scores at the stadium. And he was, I don't think he was even in a draw or something, you know, he was training and he was training with another junior. And the way he was like, like cutting off those those uh, shots and volleying, he was very young at, at, at that time. I was like, "Whoa, there's something special about this kid that is able to to read that well and and seeing the ball." Oh my gosh! And then of course the execution and the wrist, of course. But yeah, it, it looks like he had an extra gear in his mind and in his action yeah amazing so without without you saying it because obviously everyone was phenomenal rami was probably the toughest guy that you played i mean toughest i think most impressive i think yeah all of them were super tough come on it's just uh, like i said in different ways right in different ways <laughs> at that level at that level there's no this it's always tough but Rami, he could punish me. So that's the thing. He, he could also punish me uh, and in a good day. And that's, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Terry, this was uh, fantastic, sir. I appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing some specifics for our, for anyone who is not of the faint of heart. Go attempt the ghosting routine. Uh, please don't. There's <laughs> a caution there. Don't go do exactly what Terry said. <laughs> Uh, but no, this is great. I, I appreciate your emphasis on the values, on efficiency, on discipline, on passion and love uh, for the game, um, and just constantly learning. You're constantly taking a scientific approach to everything and constantly learning and improving and changing things up. So uh, a lot for people to take away from this. Uh, if you are an athlete or you're an adult, you enjoy it. Like put some of it into practice. It's going to help your game. <laughs> Well, Terry, thanks again. And uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll chat again at some point in the future. All right. Thanks. Keep doing what you're doing. Huh? I appreciate great. it. I appreciate it.